Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the final program of Friday for Reptile and Amphibian Days. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us for this special program all about the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnakes on Jekyll Island, Georgia. Good afternoon, for everybody. Program, we've got Welcome a very special to the guest. final. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to remind everybody that if you're tuning into this program, you can take advantage of closed captions by clicking on the CC button down in the YouTube toolbar right there. And there's a button that's just below that one that says subscribe. You can click that button and make sure that you stay in touch with everything that's happening here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. I'll be your host for today's program. My name is Chris Smith. I'm an educator at the museum, and I'll be keeping an eye on the chat box as well in order to get your questions and comments and pose them to today's guest speaker as we go throughout the program. Thanks again for being here. I'm really excited to host this program and learn a little bit more about these incredible animals. Today's guest is a wildlife biologist for the Jekyll Island Authority Conservation Department. Everybody, please put your hands together and welcome to the show, Joseph Colbert. Joseph, thanks for being here. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really glad to be able to spend some time talking to you about my program here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the flagship species of our predator conservation program, the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake. And uh, I'll just uh, point out that I'm the community wildlife biologist here on Jekyll Island. I've been managing this program uh, since 2016 uh, as a supervisor of it. And I've been involved as a research technician going all the way back to 2011. And I also served on the Rattlesnake Conservancy Board of Directors and as a research associate with them as well. So I want to kind of talk about how we conserve this species, which we consider a priority species on a state park with a lot of people in development. So first I want to talk about our focal species, the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake itself. So as you can see uh, in the corner there, it's got a range that kind of goes throughout the coastal plain of the Southeast. So you're looking at coastal North Carolina through South Carolina and Georgia and Florida, all the way up on into uh, Alabama, Mississippi and Louisiana. Uh, it's largely believed that they're extinct in Louisiana and they're state endangered in North Carolina, which leaves those other five states in the core of its range to support pretty much the, uh, you know, most of the populations of diamondbacks that remain. They are a top predator. They specialize in foraging on small mammals and they are a long lived species. It's said that they can live up to 20 years plus and they are recognized by this bright diamond pattern on their back, but definitely don't be fooled by that. It's great camouflage in nature, especially when they're in dense vegetation, they look kind of like sun and shade mixed together. So first I wanna to talk to you about why study rattlesnakes? And I like this quote, if you're gonna play with rattlesnakes, you better know what rattlesnakes do. There's a lot of people out there that wanna know about what rattlesnakes do for a lot of reasons. So why study rattlesnakes? Well, for one thing, venom is useful. Um, you know, we think of venom as a very scary thing, of course, because it can be, but uh, in the right application, in the right setting, um, there's been really awesome medical applications for venom. It's been used to treat stroke, heart attacks, scar tissue reduction, and even cancer treatments. In fact, the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake, the species I work with here on Jekyll, um, has been, uh, its venom has been used to, uh, to create treatments specifically for a type of breast cancer. And the other thing is, is there are probably a lot of undiscovered treatments out there. There's a lot, of, a lot that we don't know about venom yet, and you know, that leaves a lot of potential for a new discovery. And again, uh, venom can be scary. So, you know, another reason to study rattlesnakes, well, accidents can happen. Humans and domestic animals, um, once in a long while are bit by rattlesnakes. And there are a certain number of people that I each year on average about five people each year. Um, and, uh, you know, see this guy right here, he got bit, he survived. I found this image on the internet and made sure, but um, it's pretty rough experience. And it's again, something people are interested in knowing more about, especially when they're in a place that they might encounter a rattlesnake. 
Another thing uh, that makes them unique and interesting as a focal species of a research program is that they provide ecosystem services. So we know that they are small mammal specialists, so they control small mammal populations where there are small mammals. And small mammals can vector uh, several diseases to people, especially depending on where you are. And that's something that it's good to have a predator to manage. Um, we do consider them an indicator species, at least the species that I work with. Uh, they are an indicator of very healthy habitats, habitats that are dominated by, by uh, grasslands and normally places that are burned frequently. And also, they're an umbrella species, and I'll kind of explain this. So a top predator requires a lot more space than a lot of other species that are below it in the food pyramid, and they require a lot more resources. Uh, so essentially, you know, one top predator you know, requires a lot of individual insects, rodents, or, you know, snakes or something like that in the food web to eat, and a lot more space. So essentially by using predators as a focal species to manage for, uh, we're managing for a lot of things that they rely on. And that's kind of what we want to do here. And then finally, there's a lot of conservation concerns. They face a lot of threats and they have declined significantly throughout their range. We do know that they are uh, uh, particularly, um, uh, they do well in areas that are open canopy and have uh, dense ground cover. And I mean, basically kind of like what you see here in this image, it's ground cover where you got the ground covered with vegetation, mostly grassland. And this is where their food uh, resources are gonna be. And it's gonna camouflage them and give them kind of a sense of cover when they're moving through the landscape. So they know that, you know, people can't mess with them or birds can't mess with them or something like that. So one of the big threats for them is habitat loss. And one of the biggest reasons for habitat loss is human development. Um, agriculture is a big one. And then anytime people settle in an area, maybe similar to this, one of the first things we do is, is suppress fire. And these habitats right here depend on fire. Without fire, these grasslands kind of just turn into a whole bunch of trees and they close up the canopy and you don't have all that awesome diversity at the ground level. What a small mammal wants is not a, a buffet of two or three things, but they want a buffet of a hundred things. And that's what you're going to find in these grasslands at the ground level. So that's one of the big reasons why we've lost a lot of, of you know, that, why they decline so much throughout their range. And, you know, of course, I mentioned development, but if you look at the East Coast here, and it's pretty widely covered with all that light in that image up there on the left. And that just kind of lets you know how much development's taken place in the last couple of centuries. And this is pretty hard on, on the rattlesnakes. And just about anywhere you look throughout the East Coast, with a few exceptions, if you're looking at something the size of a kilometer square, you're going to see agriculture, or you're going to see neighborhoods, you're going to see some kind of development. And this definitely is very challenging for wildlife species that depend on these, these pristine areas to survive. Another big threat is roads. Diamondbacks do seem to have a tough time crossing roads. In one study by uh, Andrews and Gibbons, they looked at uh, timber rattlesnakes in this study, but they released them and had a car drive by and measured their response. And on average, when they encountered a car, their instinct was to freeze, try to rely on their camouflage and sit there. And on average, it took snakes almost 11 minutes to cross the road. So this is not good. So, you know, another car comes by and they're just sitting out in the road, they might be a target, you know, to, to be ran over afterwards. Um, another study uh, showed that there was major declines uh, with these uh, 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 coterless organisms up in uh, northern areas in Canada where uh, they were just kind of slowly declining and they were looking at them kind of, uh, you know, fewer and fewer individuals around places where they hibernate every year because of this. Um, and then uh, another study by Herman et al, they saw that snakes just on the other side of the highway were much more genetically different than snakes that were seven or eight miles away behind a mountain range. And that's because these snakes just really having a hard time crossing the highway and they're just not intermixing with each other. So roads do cause a lot of problems for, for these rattlesnakes. And that this kind of little, this little cartoon kind of sums it up. You know, the only way we're gonna get a uh, mate is if we learn how to drive. And, it can be really hard for some of these animals to cross roads. There's even national parks out there that get so much visitation certain times a year when these animals are supposed to be mating uh, that, you know, it's, it's they're genetically starting to, to see differences on either side of the road. 
Another threat that a lot of folks are familiar with is, is the threat of persecution. And people from all different backgrounds and walks of life have been known to persecute rattlesnakes. And a lot of people feel like it's their civic duty. This is just kind of culturally, you know, what they learned that, you know, these things are dangerous and, um, you know, they may not have much experience with them. And this is just kind of what's happened over time. And it's definitely taken a, a big toll on populations as well. So because of those threats, the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake was petitioned for federal protection under the Endangered Species Act in 2011. More information uh, at that point was needed to make a decision and it's still under review, but uh, it's not out of the question. Uh, Eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes were listed as threatened in 2016. The image right here you can see. So the next part of this presentation, I kind of want to talk about our research program now that we know why we want to study rattlesnakes and Eastern Diamondback rattlesnakes specifically. So I want to point out that um, it is our responsibility in the Conservation Department to conserve, manage, and restore Jekyll Island park, State Parks and natural communities and biological diversity. We provide nature-based educational and recreational opportunities for the general public and guide the uh, Jekyll Island Authority in a way that promotes sustainability. So we have four major research topics that I want to cover today, and I'm just going to kind of introduce each one of them. Uh, we uh, are looking at genetics, so kind of how are rattlesnakes on the island compared to uh, rattlesnakes elsewhere. Um, we want to do population estimates. And we want to look at how they use, select, and prefer certain types of habitats. And we're collecting information about natural history that can kind of help us, you know, learn more about how we should be managing them. So this information we believe can contribute to their persistent residence in the wild. And that is kind of our goal here, going back to what we just said about Jekyll Island. Uh, you know, it's our it's our duty to maintain for species diversity and uh, you know, try to try to do as good as we can and keep keep the balance between people and uh, wildlife species here on the island. So uh, every island does need a study site. So let's talk about Jekyll Island, our, our laboratory here. Um, Jekyll Island is a uh, island located off the coast of Georgia. So you can see um, Georgia has about a hundred mile coastline. And as far as we know, there's uh, there are diamondbacks on all 14 islands on the coast. So Jekyll Island is situated uh, not far from the Florida border on the southern part of the coast. And we have a nice variety of habitats that we find our diamondbacks in. So we have uh, we have maritime forest with wetlands in it, kind of open maritime forest. We have marsh with some high ground and some salt marsh outside of it. And we have our dune habitats. And we do find diamondbacks, eastern diamondback rattlesnakes, in all these habitats across the island. It's very dynamic. We get a lot of tidal flooding. We get a lot of island growth at certain parts of the island and we get a lot of erosion on certain parts of the island. So it's very dynamic. The wildlife have to respond to things that are constantly happening around them all the time. So uh, again, we have our, our duty to, to manage the park uh, for that, that diversity. And uh, we have a lot of priority habitats that um, we also see our rattlesnakes spend time in. Dune habitats, marsh habitats, um, a maritime live oak forest, a maritime pine, pine forest. But with that, um, Jekyll Island has a legal framework that requires about one third of the island to, to be allowable for development, but two thirds of the island must remain in its natural state. So wildlife can live in harmony alongside people, like I said earlier. So uh, what I want you to see here is that that kind of pink color in the map, that's where a lot of our development is. And you see like all those green spaces and a lot of that marsh surrounding the island. Uh, that's kind of where the wildlife, uh, that's kind of their playground. That's the place we set aside for them. And those are some of the places that we're going to talk about when we talk about managing natural habitats. So let's talk about how we collect data now. So the first research technique that we use is radio telemetry. We initiated this radio telemetry project in 2011, right after the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake was petitioned for federal listing. So far, we've targeted reproductively mature adults. We've uh, uh, radio tracked 45 individuals since 2011, um, 21 males and 24 females. We locate each snake twice a week. So that kind of allows us to keep track of them if they're moving and if they eat something, we're not gonna miss it because they eat swallows, really large 
rodents and it kind of swells up their body and we're able to see it if we don't wait too long. Um, we're not missing a whole lot about these individuals by getting out there tracking them twice a week. And then we're able to take that information and, and, and put it into maps and so that we can kind of display it for y'all and do some kind of data analysis, which I'll show you some of in, in a little bit. Um, but you can see on the surgery table up there, um, that's kind of what it looks like when they're on the table. They're, they're sedated. We do not handle them with our hands until they've actually been knocked out from, uh, from the anesthetic. And uh, you can see uh, in this next slide too, that even when we put them, uh, handle them, we use these long clear tubes that are really hard. They can't turn around and for our, you know, this is for safety purposes and it's the easiest way to handle them and uh, nobody gets bit. So the next thing I wanna talk about as far as data collection goes is, is the genetics and health stuff that we do. So we actually collect blood from them and this is what it looks like. We go out in the field, we find them, we try to make it as quick of a process as we can because we don't like stressing them out. And uh, we go ahead and collect that blood once we get them secured in those tubes and we're able to take that blood back to a, a laboratory and, and look at it more carefully. So uh, how we collect data for our population estimates. Well, this one's one of the toughest ones, uh, requires a whole lot of effort. Multiple people go out um, and we kind of look in areas where we you know, suspect this is good rattlesnake habitat. Um, we go out uh, initially looking for diamondbacks that were in our radio tracking study because to know uh, how many snakes are in an area, you have to know how often you can find them. So we realized radio tracking that a lot of times if we didn't have a transmitter, we wouldn't find them. We really wanted to know how often uh, we could or could not find them. And that kind of helped inform our population estimates. And I'll kind of explain a little more about that in a little while. But after we figure out how often we can find them or not find them, which we call detection probabilities, we kind of surveyed the broader population around the island. And then we're kind of still in progress of doing this. But it's, uh, it's been, again, a lot of work and it's been revealed some really interesting things. So for some of our results, the first thing I want to talk about is the genetics. So this is one of the most groundbreaking discoveries that, that we found since we started this project. We uh, are partnered with uh, an individual down at the University of South Florida, um, Mark Marges, um, who works in genetics and uh, venomics. So venomics is kind of like genetics, but with venom. And uh, we collected blood and, and uh, venom from snakes on the island. And he collected blood from snakes pretty much all throughout their range. So you can kind of see most of their range in this map. And he identified a very distinctive population in the west uh, of their range and a very distinctive population east of their range that they were a little bit different, but still kind of close together. And you can kind of see that on this little chart here. And he also identified Jekyll, the most different much, much different from the other populations, the most different of all the snakes that he sampled. And uh, you can kind of see them in that little blue uh, area way out there. So um, one, one of the really interesting things um, uh, about that is that um, these two little red dots out to the left are actually individuals from the northern part of the island. I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit. But um, we realized we didn't just have this isolated Jekyll population, we had an isolated uh, population of uh, individuals from that eastern area too. So we really wanted to know why, what could cause something like this. So we're going to look back at this development map and see how much of that development's in the middle of the island. And I'm just going to show you a collection of all the points on each part of the island. So pretty much everywhere where you see that green area, that nice open patch that's kind of continuous throughout the landscape, that's where we find our diamondbacks. And anywhere where we have that development, we really don't see them there. And then again, that that is two red dots that are kind of moving a little closer to that blue area. The, the Jekyll population belong to individuals on the northern part of the island. You see that big group of points up there. And all of our Jekyll rattlesnakes, our genetically isolated rattlesnakes, are south of that road that comes into the main island. So this right there alarmed us that we need to learn more about the population itself. So we realized they are isolated, which made uh, made it really urgent that we find out how big or small our population actually is. So um, populations uh, 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 are hard to survey for because uh, diamondbacks are very cryptic. They're very stealthy, like I mentioned before. So again, we had to go out there and you can see these two people right in the middle of the screen, um, right in this big area. They pretty much surveyed that entire area and they're kind of walking you know, up and down until they covered the whole area. 
until they feel like they've covered as much as they can looking for any snakes they can find. And uh, again, we were trying to find out how often we could or could not find them. So uh, think of these like a percentage, but about 33% of the time here on Jekyll Island, we're able to find uh, um, a snake when there's one in a plot that we know about. So uh, you know, one out of every three times uh, we, we, we you know, do three surveys, we're able to find the snake one time essentially. Um, and another way to think about that is, is um, for every one snake we find, we're missing two when we go out there looking for new snakes. And that's kind of how we figure out how to make those population estimates. We find out how much space we surveyed and we figure out how many snakes we've seen, probably not seen, and make our population estimate from there. So Joseph, can I ask a quick question then about these sure, numbers? Absolutely. Because I'm, I'm curious, are, is this a good number? Like is one out of three surveys you're gonna find the snake or you're missing two out of three on any particular survey run, would you expect it to be higher or is this sort of like industry standard stuff? It's, it's not a good number or a bad number. It is whatever the number is and that number helps us make that population estimate. So if we're able to determine that we're definitely missing on average, we're missing about two snakes for every one we find, we're accounting for them when we make that population estimate. The best number is, is you know, whatever the number is and just finding that number and doing all that work to, to get that number is the most important part. Um, getting those detection probabilities, if that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I understand that much better now. Um, and let me throw a question at you from the chat real quick too, uh, related to some of the surveys you're doing. Have you ever had a rattlesnake get stuck in a tube we haven't had one get stuck in a tube, but they kind of do try to muscle their way in there and they, they do get wedged in pretty good. Um, uh, but uh, there's just enough space and we got different size tubes. So if we think one's a little too big for a tube, we'll go down and we'll go up to a bigger size or, you know, if they're a little small, maybe go down to a smaller size. But we keep a lot of those kind of different size tubes available to us so that we can make sure we got the right size for each one. Um, Definitely in the past, a lot of folks that worked with, with snakes, venomous snakes, they handled them and a lot of times they got bit. But this is something that doesn't really happen anymore because we're really careful and yeah, we definitely really like our tools these days. Yeah, I was gonna say definitely use the tube instead of just grabbing a diamond back rattlesnake. Yeah, definitely something nobody should ever do. Those tools exist for a reason, for sure. For professionals only too. Correct. So um, I can talk a little bit about the habitat now. So we know a little bit about our genetic situation. We know they're isolated. So we're working with a population that's kind of really, uh, you know, separated from everywhere else. And we know from our detection probabilities that uh, we think that the population size is probably somewhere between maybe 62 to 80 adults on the southern portion of the island. So the next thing we want to find out from our research program here is we want to learn more about their habitat. We want to learn more about what habitat uh, is best for them, what kind of challenges they face in certain habitats, how a development around those habitats may impact them. There's just a lot of questions we can answer by looking at how they use or select certain types of habitats. And uh, that's kind of what we were going for when we went to this part of the study. But again, uh, a lot of what we understand about the, the diamondback is that they're separated by this development. So it does seem like they're avoiding development. They're avoiding open spaces like golf courses and soccer fields and mowed lawns. Um, they're uh, seemingly avoiding roads for the most part. We get very few crossings. We've actually only had about 24 crossings in the last nine years. There's 45 snakes we've tracked. And you see those points are really close to roads in some situations. They're just not crossing them. So there's a lot of these, th these things in the landscape that seem to be deferring their movement. So um, to talk about, you know, their individuals uh, and some of their home ranges, um, you see that we have snakes using the forest. We have snakes using marsh habitat right there in the middle and snakes using the dunes down there in the south end. And one of the snakes I want to talk about, and this is a very interesting way of how she uses habitat, is this one right here. This snake, her name is Elvira. She was part of our study from 2011 until 2017, I think. And uh, she uh, had this relationship with um, uh, uh, the marsh where she foraged all the way down south 
all right, where that little kind of round hammock is down there. You see all those points at the bottom of the screen. And uh, every winter, she kind of went back up and didn't quite cross the road. She just kind of skirted the edge of the road and went around this water park here. That's what this is, a water park. And uh, they never really go into the water park. They just use this vegetated edge around it. And there's this wall of riprap. It's a bunch of uh, rocks that are piled up to kind of armor the, the uh, water park from any tidal action. Well, it seems like this is one of the few situations where something that humans created is actually maybe beneficial to the snake. She's not the only snake that we see do this. We've actually seen a lot of snakes that uh, use that marsh area down there um, do this. Um, it's kind of like a, you know, kind of like a routine for them. They wake up from hibernation. Uh, they kind of, you know, start to sun themselves for a little while. And right about the time when people start showing up to the water park, they really need to kick off their foraging season in high gear. And it really doesn't seem like they like to be around people anyway. So they go south and they forage pretty much all summer and, you know, throughout the fall. And then they make their way back right when people are kind of like shutting down the water park and, and not there anymore. So that was one really neat thing that we found is that there's kind of this annual migration for, you know, snakes that use this rock wall in the winter when nobody's there. But it is a human structure that they're using, which, you know, seems like it's not happening very often. And I'll just kind of show you another uh, way we've looked at home ranges. And these kind of like uh, maybe over exaggerate the size of a range, but they just draw kind of like a polygon. It's called minimum convex polygon around each of the points. And you can kind of see how different snakes maybe use different amounts of space or different types of space around the island, stuff like that. Then there's the natural history. So um, Elvira again, here we have Elvira. And what I want you to pay attention to on her little timeline here is that in that time that we tracked her from 2011 to 2017, she only gave birth one time. Um, we tried to look at the literature to find out how often these snakes reproduce, and there's a lot of conflicting reports, and we realized it's something we need to pay attention to ourselves. So uh, based on our data so far, it seems like our snakes are reproducing somewhere between maybe once every five and a half to maybe eight, uh, 8.25 years. So uh, throughout their entire life, if they're living to be 12 years old, you know, maybe they're reproducing only once or maybe twice if they're lucky. So this is something that, you know, we want to try to conserve our, our female rattlesnakes as much as we can. Uh, it seems like, you know, um, um, it, you know, they need to reproduce and succeed in reproducing as much as possible to keep the population sustainable here. So Joseph, you said there were conflicting reports on how often females do lay eggs. They give live birth. Is, oh, give live birth. Uh, what, what are some of the numbers then? Is there like a, a range? Is Elvira, is this more normal? Is, would you think it's abnormal or is there just not enough information? I think that it really depends on where you are. So um, our, our rattlesnakes uh, give birth in the fall. They give live birth. They're over um, um, uh, And I, it takes them about a year of being what we call gravid or pregnant or gestating before they can even give birth. So, uh, you know, it's something they got to prepare for way far in advance. And uh, it may just depend on where they are in a place where food resources are plentiful, the stress is low, the environment is great. Maybe it's warmer somewhere like in Florida, maybe they're reproducing every two to three years if they're in a great place. And, uh, you know, it may just depend on what kind of things are going on around you. And, you know, Jekyll may be uh, at the high end, we're not entirely sure. But um, there are definitely um, uh, research studies with things like uh, other snake species, like timber rattlesnakes, that may live as much as 25 years in the wild, and you know they may only give birth one time. So again, it really may just depend on the habitat and the, and the situation they're in. And you you might be getting to this question in a slide coming up soon, based on what we were just talking about. But I'm going to go ahead and throw this one out from the chat. How many individuals are needed for a healthy genetic pool? in a population? Ooh, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that question. I've heard, I've heard things, you know, as a student when I was in school, you know, 500 is the minimum or something like that. But I also, again, I think that really depends on the species. Um, uh, rattlesnakes maybe have, have a higher tolerance and can have a lower numbers. I'm not entirely sure about that. And I don't want to tell you the wrong answer, but um, um, definitely, if, you know, the, the bigger the population is, the better it's going to be. And that's, that's one thing that's for sure. Um, we definitely have concerns because, you know, we think our population on the south end is pretty small if those population estimates are accurate, right? So anything we can do to, to boost those numbers would be ideal. Um, 
best I can answer that question. Forgive me. No, that's great. Great information. Thank you. Um, I will talk about um, another snake that we tracked, a large male. Um, and what I want you to pay attention to in his timeline is, uh, is how often can they eat. Um, people, you know, don't always know what to think about rattlesnakes and their, their feeding habits. And, you know, if you think about an animal like a bobcat or an alligator, even, they eat a lot. They constantly eat. Um, they, anytime food comes by, they eat. Or, you know, for a, a bobcat, you know, they're eating every couple of days at least to survive. But rattlesnakes, not, not, not so much. They're... You know, uh, a rattlesnake uh, may weigh five or six, seven pounds, you know, uh, and, you know, they, they may only eat once or twice in a year sometimes. I've definitely seen some not eat certain years. You know, females that are gravid or gestating, like I said before, oftentimes don't eat at all. They just focus on kind of uh, thermoregulating and taking care of their young. So, um, you know, a lot of people think maybe they're out there eating like once a week or once a month or something like that. And the truth of it is, is um, on average, we see that our rattlesnakes in bean habitats eat about 1.34 times a year. And rattlesnakes in the forest are eating about 0.88 times a year, at least those large meals that we can definitely detect. So um, that was one of the things that, you know, I think surprises a lot of people. But um, this snake here actually did a really good job um, eating. You know, he's a very successful eater. And uh, he was eating, you know, a little bit higher than those averages, and he was a gene snake too. So it was good, good to have to catch him down there. And then uh, finally, um, this snake was. This is one of the longest snakes we've had in the study. He's still here to with us today. Um, we still track him. Um, he. Uh, he he does this thing where he likes to change hibernacula in the wintertime and. A lot of people think of uh, overwintering as kind of like this thing where like these rattlesnakes go underground and some of them do up north, some timber rattlesnakes do this. They go into like a hole and they stay there pretty much for many, many months without coming out. And you know, they slowly come out and maybe just to, like, get some sun every now and then. Snakes down here can be pretty mobile and you know the weather permits it. It gets a little bit warm sometimes in January, February and they come up on the surface and maybe they decide they didn't like the whole area in before and they want to switch it up. Or, Maybe it rains a little hard and gets wet in there and they go find a drier place or something like that. But um, there's definitely some things we have to think about. You know, they're a little bit slower in that time of year. And, you know, if they are changing hypernacular, they may, may be a little more vulnerable. So these are things we like to know. It kind of helps us know maybe what to do or how to manage them better. And then the last thing, um, as far as our, our natural history stuff goes, is we started looking at health. Um, our uh, partners, the Georgia Sea Turtle Center, who are also here on Jekyll Island, um, have a, a laboratory that we're able to bring back slides and blood to and process, and we can send it off to be analyzed. Um, we have folks from the University of Miami analyze these chemistry panels when we send off plasma and blood to them. And our folks at Zoo Aquatic, uh, they look at slides. And this is actually a slide we collected, and it's got a few parasites in it. So you see some of those little purple ones with that clear stuff around it? Those are some of our parasites right next to some of our, our snake's blood cells. So, you know, we're looking at how disease may affect them. We're looking at what a healthy snake's blood chemistry should be like, just like when we go to the doctor and have blood pulled from us. Um, we can kind of look at those, uh, you know, those results and see, does it fall in the range of normal? Is it a little bit low? Is something a little bit high? And uh, we've got some really interesting results from that. And one of the things we found is that um, with our, our blood chemistry panels, we can actually look at our females and determine if they're gonna be gravid up to a year, if they're gonna give birth, uh, you know, within a, a year of certain elevated levels of certain blood chemistry. So that was a really neat thing and something we're definitely interested in trying to uh, take advantage of and learn more about. So yeah, baseline health parameters. We, we look at body condition index. So we kind of look at kind of just like we have a body mass index. We just call it a body condition index. It's essentially the same thing for the snakes. And uh, we've been able to kind of look at disease and parasite stuff and that predictive reproductive tool that I just mentioned. So I want to kind of go back through these four research topics and I want to kind of connect them, right? So I talked about genetics first because it was one of the biggest discoveries. It was one of the things that made us go, whoa, something's going on here. We need to do some serious research and find out what's going on and figure out how we can do better by those species. But the first thing we need to know is what are their population sizes? How sensitive are they? And it seems like they're probably pretty low. If we're talking about maybe 62 to 80 adults on the south end, 
then we need to kind of treat them like maybe we would treat an endangered species that was endemic to an area that, you know, they have a really small population in. And we're looking at habitat to try to inform some solutions to help them. And we're also looking at that natural history stuff, again, to try to help provide solutions or at least inform the way we manage. Which brings me to part three of our, our discussion here. Um, solutions, or as we like to call it in our field, management. So we have forever altered the earth and it, and we cannot abandon it to a random fate. It is our duty to manage it. A quote by Emma Maris, I love it. Um, it's definitely uh, kind of sums up the idea that, you know, humans have impacted the landscape a lot. And because we have, you know, we can't just trust the landscape to manage itself like it once did. We have to go in there and kind of actively manage it. So we know that they're separated. We know that there's development on the island and we can't do anything about, you know, a lot of development, but with the spatial stuff and the genetic stuff and the population estimates, there actually may be an opportunity soon for us to create a corridor in the middle of the island. And this is one of the most interesting solutions um, and one of my favorite, uh, because I mean, this is kind of like a big deal. You don't hear about this kind of stuff going on with predators on a small scale. A lot of times, a lot of times you hear about stuff out west where they create bridges and you know road passages for, for stuff and that's great. And, here we are in this small community and we're making this consideration. I'm pretty excited about this. Um, but uh, the golf course may be making some transitions that they give up some holes. They don't give up all the golf, but maybe some holes so that we can create some kind of like grass and habitat in the middle of the island. Again, this would be really big, really big stuff. And the benefit we get from that is it connects those two populations and kind of instead of managing two populations that are isolated by themselves that, you know, maybe either one can go extinct we're managing one population. And uh, now that I'm talking about this, I kind of want to point something else out. What we really suspect is going on here is that Jekyll's probably been isolated for some time because it's an island, you know, it's, it's several miles from across Marsh to mainland. Uh, there's a city to our east. There's a, a island that's developed to our north. And, you know, there are a few places that are undeveloped south of us, but you don't think that these rattlesnakes are exchanging, you know, from one place to another very often. What we think happened is that these snakes were genetically isolated on the island and developed kind of probably uh, divided them. And the ones on the north end might have gone extirpated or locally extinct is what we call that um, and recolonized by that eastern population. So there may be some, you know, getting here uh, once in a long while. But uh, again, you know, if that is the case, the prognosis is not good. If we've already lost one of our populations and it was recolonized, we definitely would benefit them more if we could connect them, right? So um, our, our folks from Duke University, um, Hannah and, uh, and uh, Kelly, Will and Joyner, uh, prepared this kind of uh, uh, management analysis where they looked at how a corridor might work on the island. And this kind of helped inform what we would do when we update our golf course master plan. And, uh, you know, we're trying to take those steps right now. And over the next couple of years, we may actually start being able to purchase seed, collect seed, put plants in the ground and start kind of building that landscape that we know is going to benefit them on the golf course and connect those two populations. Unfortunately, they'd still have to cross the roads. There's a couple of roads they'd have to cross, but having the right kind of habitat may help solve that, you know, or at least, you know, uh, help them succeed in getting to the other side and having the habitat that's good to move through there. So uh, kind of in that same line, restoration and restoration is not just for like that golf course habitat, but there are other places on the island that, you know, might, might use a little bit of help. We can throw out seed in some places or plant plants in certain places to restore certain types of rare habitats, some of these coastal grasses. Um, and there's also um, uh, a lot of plant species that, you know, we've collected seed from that, you know, we'd, we'd like to try to make a head start and put in different habitats. And uh, one of the ways we're restoring uh, areas is through land management, through our fire management program. Um, like I told you before, one of the big things about uh, the Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake uh, having declined so much is that habitat loss. And a lot of that had to do with the removal of fire in the landscape. Um, they do best in habitats that are burned because they they keep that that kind of that grassy ground cover. And you know, think of a fire kind of like mowing the lawn. You go out there and you mow the lawn and it kind of resets things and it grows back. And, uh, you know, if you stop mowing the lawn, you might just have a forest grow up and you're always going to have, you know, maybe a few trees out there, right? And everything they eat, small mammals, is at the ground level and they depend on other plants to grow at the ground level. 
So prescribed fire, um, and what we're doing right now is what we call restoration burns. So kind of connects to that last topic, restoration. But um, prescribed fire is one of the best things we can do for them. And um, the north uh, is the north part of the island is mostly forest, and we're really trying to kind of uh, burn more in that area to start with, and kind of encourage more of that that plant. Uh, you know, life will really recover at ground level. And, you know, there's some species that are dominant, but we expect those species to kind of maybe reduce and a lot more species grow in between those dominant species. And our other big uh, management strategy is, is education. You know, the more we connect with people and the more people know about what we do and the more people will know about the story of imperiled rattlesnakes, you know, the more we can get them to act and, and you know, help us take action to, to solve some of the problems. And I really like this one. Um, this is a, a, a little image of uh, these kids the first time they touch a snake or an alligator. And it's it's what we call guided exposure. So we're professionals, we're experts, we're there with them. And, you know, maybe they're a little scared because they've never done it before, but they feel good because we're there with them and they know they trust us, you know. And, uh, you know, it's really surprising how many kids, you know, it's the first time they touch a certain kind of animal. Um, events and fundraisers, and it's really nice because a lot of times we're out in the field getting dirty, and it's nice to kind of dress up and you know go talk to our folks and educate and you know, tell them about what we're doing. Um, in field education, and this one's great, and it's kind of funny because a lot of times when we track these rattlesnakes and you know we get there right in front of them, they just they just sit there, they're just really sedentary. They kind of rely on their camouflage, and they're really confident in their camouflage, and they won't move. And you know, people are like, "It's kind of anticlimactic." I was really scared. I was expecting it to do something, but it's just sitting there. And I'm like, "Yeah, it's, it's kind of what we want y'all to know when we take y'all out to the field." And uh, you know, transparency. And if you look in the background here, where we're doing the surgery, and this is with our folks again at the Georgia Sea Turtle Center, the veterinarian over there is the one who does our transmitter surgeries. Um, People can see right into that viewing window, um, and there's a person close to the viewing window who's got like a little earpiece in, and she's talking to those people on the other side, and they ask questions and hold it up on a whiteboard, and we can answer them uh, to the best of our ability and kind of tell them a little bit about our program, why they're looking at us working and operating on a rattlesnake on a surgery table. And then we have this wildlife response program, and um, um, one of the things people will call us about, because a lot of people in our community now know that we are interested in studying these rattlesnakes is uh, they'll call us and let us know there's a rattlesnake here. There's, you know, one I saw when I was walking or biking on a path or, you know, they kind of direct us to where the rattlesnakes are. And this really helps us kind of beef up our numbers and account for more individuals that are out there and enter more individuals in the study when we when we have space to do that. So, um, and it's an opportunity to talk to people uh, when we get out there. It's an opportunity to kind of educate them and again, talk about rattlesnakes and talk about some of the issues that other predators face and, you know, talk about our program and stuff like that. And of course, busting myths. You know, there's a lot of lot of information out there, and you know, we're very polite and pragmatic in how we do this. But you know, we tell people, you know, like what we know. We tell people what we've learned through our study. Uh, we try to provide them with the best facts possible, and you know, resources to to you know, uh, look and find those facts for themselves. And um, again, you know, we want to make sure that we're making sure that the right information is getting out there. And a lot of times, we're really just talking about what we see here and using that, you know, to support the statements that we're saying. So what people can do, um, you know, uh, you know, individuals, you can kind of educate and tell people the story of imperiled snakes, you know, tell people about what, you know, I've talked about today, um, direct people to good resources like uh, the Rattlesnake Conservancy's webpage is great. We have a lot of good facts about rattlesnakes and a lot of other additional facts about, you know, steps you can take to, to help them. Um, Talk about programs and training, like the first responder grants and venomous handling training. Um, that's something else that the Rattlesnake Conservancy does as well. And uh, support us through donations or volunteerism. You know, we always appreciate uh, program support to help keep research studies like this and some of the programs, the education programs alive. And uh, also consider a career in conservation-based research and management. It's a very rewarding career. Um, you know, none of us can promise that you'll get paid very much, but it is definitely very rewarding and very enjoyable. And, uh, you know, you can definitely make a positive influence doing this kind of career. And uh, before closing, I'll tell you about one of our rare predators. I've talked so far about our Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake, and we do have, um, we have radio tracked one uh, um, canebrake rattlesnake. Uh, people call them timbers up north. We call them canebrakes down here where I'm at in Georgia. Um, our little coastal canebrake. 
And we found one other neonate cambrake, um, which, you know, we're not entirely sure, but, you know, it's possible that it could have came from our adult or maybe one of her sisters, um, our adult was a female. But in truth, we've only found two and a half cane breaks since we started this study. And uh, I think this is really neat. I say two and a half, okay? So this is like our third half. It's like a half cane break, half diamond back hybrid. Um, it was a really interesting thing that we found. Um, but again, we've in the time that we found 218 diamondbacks, eastern diamondback rattlesnakes, we found three cane breaks. And we think that our female or maybe one of her sisters that's, that's here on the island, we haven't found yet, possibly. Um, was, uh, uh, you know, uh, probably because of restricted mate access, probably made it with a diamondback and, and made this, this little hybrid baby. And we actually uh, radio track it and we're learning about it. And it's been a very interesting uh, kind of, uh, you know, educational experience. So um, with that, I have a lot of people to thank. It takes, a, you, know, a, you know, an individual can't do a study like this. It takes an entire tribe. Uh, we've got a lot of people that have worked very uh, intricately and intimately with the study um, to collect data to, to you know, support the study and to support some of our activities around it. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate everybody who's contributed and those, those organizations that have helped us financially and all that stuff. And with that, I'm, I'm all ready to take as many questions as you have. I'm sure you picked up a whole bunch of questions through the chat and uh, yeah, thanks for hearing me out and letting me talk about this with an audience for so long, I do appreciate it. All right. Fantastic stuff. Everybody, great big round of applause for Joseph and for the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnakes of Jekyll Island. We give them a round of applause too. <laughs> True enough. Thank you. Yeah, great stuff. So here are the questions that I have from the chat for you. Um, the first one that came in was, can rattlesnakes swim? Because they want to know how these snakes got to Jekyll Island in the first place. Great question. Okay, so first, uh, the first question is, can rattlesnakes swim? The answer is yes. Do they do it very often? Probably not. Um, I've seen one rattlesnake in all my time, we've collected about 7,000 points now, um, and it was swimming probably because it had to, because the tide came into the point where it kind of got flooded where it was at near Mars Edge, and it did a little swimming when I got close to it. Um, and I kind of left it be, and you know, since we were in water, uh, and that was it. But um, yeah, they can. And um, there have been observations from folks that run shrimp boats seeing them three miles offshore. Um, it doesn't happen very often, it happens once in a long while. So, you know, diamondbacks can definitely move from, uh, you know, mainland to an island or island to an island or something like that. Um, how diamondbacks get to these islands, the, 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 I think that it's quite possible that these diamondbacks were here in uh, older times when you know, the sea level was much lower and those, those very islands were actually connected to the mainland. And then, you know, it's quite possible that as sea levels rose, they kind of trapped some, some individuals here. And um, there are some species that have probably been here since that, that time frame, many thousand years ago. Like there's maybe some crawfish that there's no way they can move across the marsh or maybe certain frog species that are here that can't exactly move across the marsh, but are still here from, from those times. Chris, uh, I can't hear you. I'm back. Can you hear me now? Okay. So the next question that came up was, what do the rattlesnakes do to survive hurricanes? Good question. Every time a hurricane happens, we have to evacuate, but um, we always come back and we track them right after, um, you know, we're able to come back in and, um, um, you know, we have seen them do a little bit of movement. They may hunker down and go underground. Um, they, they generally don't sit somewhere where it's going to be like a whole lot of velocity from the wind. They may try to seek a little bit of kind of like shelter from the wind, but it seems like they, they kind of, you know, they're biologically programmed to, to be able to, to, you know, do what they need to do to at least escape the worst of it. And um, we haven't really seen like rattlesnakes, you know, perish or die during a hurricane or anything like that. So whatever they're doing, they're succeeding. They've figured out how to make it work for them. And I will say this, uh, one thing about hurricanes too, that's really interesting. You know, well, hurricanes knock down a lot of trees and going back to the fact that these diamondbacks like early successional habitat, we know that in areas where a lot of these trees fall, 
kind of those plant communities, like those, those early successional plants kind of come back in where that canopy had been closed up. And it seems like, you know, we don't want to lose all our trees, but once in a while having a tree fall down, you know, it encourages good habitat for some species like rattlesnakes out there in the forest. Oh, okay. So uh, hurricanes are part of the natural cycles that encourage habitat growth and regeneration in lots of different ways. And that's going to help the snakes as much as it would. Absolutely. You, 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 when a tree falls down, you kind of like have a bunch of sunlight hit the ground floor that wasn't there before. And a lot of other plants start growing and that serves mammals well. And snakes, you know, know where mammals are. And they're going to show up and look for them pretty quick. So. All right. So the next one is about rattlesnake young. Uh, do adults care for their young at all after giving birth? I love this question. Um, I didn't mention that earlier either, but rattlesnakes, um, it, the Eastern Bionic particularly is known to, um, once they give birth, they give live birth. So um, you know, one of the first things that's going to happen is that you're going to kind of maybe be in like a den or a hole or somewhere a little bit kind of tucked away safer. And they're going to kind of go out and bask. And mom's going to be right around them when they bask. So um, and they're going to kind of use the same place that mom's using. And um, it seems like they do spend at least, you know, maybe as much as little as four days or as much as three weeks in, in that kind of situation where they're all kind of close together. And um, by my understanding, based on some some conversations I've had with other researchers and posters and uh, information I've seen at conferences, they kind of, after they shed and start getting settled in, they kind of move away from mom. And, you know, she has like 16 of those live young. They may all go different random directions um, as they're, they're kind of moving away. But okay. it does seem like there is some some degree of parental care, you know, if something comes up there and they're basking, you know, and maybe it's a king snake or a, a, some kind of bird of prey. Mom's right there to rattle and maybe let them know they need business, at least for that that you know first couple weeks of their life or the first couple of days. All right. Uh, the next couple of questions are about uh, wildlife corridors and habitat connections. Would wildlife tunnels help them cross roads safely and would rattlesnakes even use them? That is a question that I do not know. That's a question that definitely requires some research. Um, I haven't heard of anybody talk about rattlesnakes using corridors. Um, I don't know, like, you know, like, if, you know, maybe there needs to be something done specifically to encourage rattlesnakes to use something like that. Um, not entirely sure very new stuff um, um, you know as far as the field of ecology goes corridor corridor science and uh, definitely very um, um, you know unstudied as far as rattlesnakes go so um, those questions could potentially be the subject of research down the road as, as we progress in uh, progress things here um, but that that would be kind of maybe a dream situation that we not only create that habitat on all sides of those roads but maybe some way to, to navigate those roads where they actually don't have to cross them and being risk run over at the same time. Something yeah, you know, so we may talk about in the future after we tackle some of the other stuff with the corridors. There's always future research questions. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> One of our viewers wants to know what they should do if they find a snake trying to cross the road. So, um, you know, what I tell people here on Jekyll Island and, and you know, and, and you know, safety is the most important thing, of course, so, you know, you don't want to, you know, maybe if you see something crossing the road, any animal, you don't want to just slam on the brakes if somebody's going to like, you know, run into you behind you or, or, you know, park your car somewhere where somebody might hit you. So, you know, you have to think about those things. But on Jekyll Island, you know, if somebody sees something crossing the road, you know, it's okay if they kind of come to a stop and their hazard lights on and kind of like, you know, wait for the animal to move across the road, which could take a long time. Um, you know, people, when they see stuff like that, will call us. But um, yeah, and it could take a while for it to cross the road. Um, you know, there's not always like a, a great option uh, for people that are in a hurry. If a snake takes an average of 11 minutes to cross the road once it's <laughs> far, you know, but, but it's something people can do um, is just kind of give it an opportunity to cross. and. Give it a little distance. If you're too close to it, it's not going to move. It's going to feel a little bit vulnerable and exposed in you know an open area. And uh, you know, honestly, you know, depending on how far it's already crossing the road, you know, don't be surprised if it turns around and goes back. Um, we've definitely seen snakes do that here. They kind of turn around and go back. But when they want to cross the road, 
and they kind of make up their mind. And a lot of times they commit to it. So eventually they're just going to wait till they don't see cars come in, maybe hang out in some vegetation and you know, make that trek across the road later. So there you go, folks. And if you think it's venomous, don't grab it and help it. Correct. I didn't say that. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, you don't want to go out and handle something. Like I told you before, we always use tools. We don't you did handle say. animals. Um, you know, we, we don't we don't want to get bit. We don't want anybody else to get bit either. So, you know, if somebody needs to handle something, call your professional. You know, call your wildlife, you know, biologist or uh, somebody at your natural resource department or whatever it is in your state. And, you know, see, see what, what they can do or what they tell you. All right. Carrie's asking, are the babies mostly eating invertebrates? I don't think so. We've seen some some very small ones uh, um, with with rats, rodents, mice. So um, they're probably you know they're probably coming out you know uh, eating smaller rodents right away. Honestly, um, I've got um, a picture. It's not in this presentation, unfortunately, but I have one that um, um, it was probably no more than. 50 grams and had what appeared to be a cotton rat in it, which is, you know, a really well-developed cotton rat could be sometimes like 120 grams or maybe more. So, um, yeah. And they swallow their food whole and, you know, they have this big old, you know, lump in them. Uh, if anybody's ever seen a snake that's been fed or had one as a pet knows what I'm talking about, but um, some of these snakes, especially rattlesnakes, they'll swallow stuff that's so big, it's kind of crazy to think about. So the last question is mine. How do people who live or work on Jekyll Island who aren't in wildlife conservation uh, interact with with you, other people, and with the snakes? What, what's the human wildlife element there between folks who just use the island for work or recreation and the snakes? You know, um, there's, there's definitely like kind of like maybe three groups I'll talk about here. Our staff here are amazing. Uh, we got a lot of people in a lot of different departments. You know, we have a marketing department. We have, you know, people that are in retail, people that work at the water park, people that maintain our roads and grounds. And when they see something that, you know, uh, we, they know we're interested in, they call us. Um, when they need something from us, you know, they let us know. Um, you know, when it comes to the diamondback rattlesnake, you know, there may have been different kind of protocols uh, before we got here, but since we've been here, people have been really supportive throughout the staff. The same goes for residents. Residents on this island, a lot of them ask me, you know, why the heck would you want to go track a snake like that that's venomous? You know, what are you going to do when you get there? Remove it? And it's like, no, no, we're just trying to learn more about it. You know, there's problems. They're up for consideration for protection. And we're just kind of trying to learn about it. And now some of these folks are so protective of, of these snakes that, you know, if their favorite one got ran over, they would be upset. And they'd make sure that, you know, they'd let people know about it. And um, then there are, are guests or tourists or visitors. And I think sometimes, you know, uh, depending on where folks come from or kind of, you know, where they sit culturally, they may be more inclined to, you know, maybe run them over on purpose or maybe try to kill a snake. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's a demographic that we, we try to reach. And, uh, you know, sometimes those folks that are here visiting see us, you know, radio tracking. And again, it's just kind of impromptu education opportunity to talk to those folks. and kind of tell them what we know about. And a lot of times those people that maybe feel like that, if you start telling them about the genetic issues and the population issues, maybe they think a little different. They're like, all right, you know, well, this is an isolated population and you're treating it like an endangered species. Maybe I'll be a little more kind. So, you know, I think we sometimes can change people's minds about stuff like that. But our, our residents and our staff here, extremely supportive, um, you know, great experiences with them. Well, that's, that's really good in here. Encouraging news to hear. Well, Joseph, I think the snakes would agree. Uh, we're all glad that you're out there working to understand and protect them. If they could tell us, I'm sure the snakes would give you a round of applause too. So thanks so much for being a part of Reptile and Amphibian Days this afternoon and sharing your work with us. Thank you very much for letting me share our story about our snakes and our program. I really, really appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in to, to this program. Uh, let's see. What do I need to remind you of? Oh, there's more Reptile and Amphibian Days programs happening tomorrow on Saturday. So make sure that you visit naturalsciences.org. Click on the Reptile and Amphibian Days link so that you can see all of the great programs and opportunities to learn more that we have for you tomorrow. If you uh, are enjoying the programming 
and you're not already a member of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, or you need to renew your membership, doing so can be very beneficial right now. Because if you join or renew your membership, you can get a free Reptile and Amphibian Days t-shirt. That's right. And they're pretty snazzy. We've got them in lots of different colors. And the logo's not an Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake. I'm sorry. But the logo this year is our state salamander in North Carolina, the marbled salamander. So it's a pretty cool design, too. So I'd encourage everybody to check out the, the museum's website and you can also check out the museum store if you like the shirt and want to get one. They're available there as well. So make sure that you subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel, follow the museum on social media for all the latest updates. We're at Natural Sciences on every social media network just about. And I hope that we'll see you again soon at the next program. Joseph, thanks again, and I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye, everybody.